16. England, 1555. The Protestant and Catholic churches are at each other's throats. Queen Mary I, Catholic supremacist and royal nutcase, is sweeping through the land and exterminating as many of these Protestant heretics as possible, earning her the nickname Bloody Mary. In the end, over 280 martyrs were made that day. Killed, burned at the stake, executed. One of these Protestants, a 30-year-old man by the name of Thomas Hubbard, was burned at the stake for not renouncing his Protestant faith. Not much is known about Thomas Hubbard, except that he had a son, James, who in turn had his own son, Samuel. I know it's a lot of names, but just stick with me. Samuel Hubbard, grandson of the martyr, Thomas Hubbard, because of the persecution in England, emigrated to America and started one of the first families in Rhode Island. Now, I know you're asking, Joy, why are you telling us such a weird story? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is because Thomas Hubbard is actually my 13th great-grandfather. Isn't that weird to think about? <laughs> 280 martyrs and I've got the blood of them running through my veins. <laughs> my mom likes to call him a rock star ancestor, and I guess she's kind of right. But I do think about him a lot. I think about how Thomas Hubbard, a regular old Protestant Englishman, was burnt at the stake, and because of that, his grandson came to America. I think about how that family line has continued on through the generations to here, to now, to me. I think about how God used my entire family tree and two whole continents just so I could stand here and preach. When you take a step back, you can see God's design in a lot of families. In fact, if you turn to Matthew, the entire first chapter, not the entire chapter, but the first 16 verses of the first chapter is just the genealogy of Jesus, starting from Abraham, going through David, to Joseph, and finally to Christ himself. If you notice, each person in this family line has a purpose. Each person is a cog in a well-oiled machine to advance the kingdom of God. And he does the same for us, too. From the beginning of time, we were in the works, and the works will continue from us. But, how do we know? Right, why should we have any hope for the future? Again, I'm glad you asked. You guys are asking some really good questions today. I'm impressed. <laughs> the Apostle Paul says something pretty interesting in the book of Ephesians, if you turn there with me. The exact verse we're looking at is Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10. You guys must have heard this soul verse a thousand times by now. And as Bible college students, I can understand that. But just humor me, just for a little bit. It says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Isn't this verse neat? Mm -hmm. Not only does it give us hope for the future, but it's also cut into these nice little sections that make it so easy to digest. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now that first part, for we are God's handiwork, is something that has been ingrained in our minds since the first day of Sunday school. We get the gist, right? We are created in God's image. We know the drill. In fact, it says so in Genesis 1.27. You guys don't have to turn there. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. So we know this is something special, right? God created us in his image, so of course he has something prepared in us for advance. There's a problem here though, and that problem is this is all very singular. You are made in the image of God, yes, but that's not what Paul says. We are God's handiwork. We are made in the image of God. We, as in people who aren't you, they're also made in the image of God. You're made in God's image. I'm made in God's image. Your friends are in, made in God's image. Your enemies are made in God's image. Your parents are made in God's image. <laughs> and I know we're still a bit sore from that. It may be easier for some of us to digest than others. Isn't that kind of strange to think about as well? Your enemies or your parents is God's handiwork. Perhaps your dad with anger issues the friend that gossiped about you behind your back. All of the people who make it seem like there's no happy ending to this story. Do you think Thomas Hubbard ever thought about his executioners as God's handiwork? The martyrs were, of course, but so was Queen Mary and her Catholic extremists. 
ourselves. We are made in the image of God. In fact, in Ephesians 2.10, the Greek says, we are what he has made. We are what he has made. Our identity is rooted in the fact that we are God's handiwork. Now all we need is a sticker that says, hello, my name is child of the one true king. Sorry. <laughs> this is already quite a bit of hope for the future, right? If we are God's handiwork, then everything should be fine. Everything should be hunky-dory, but that's not the case. There will always be someone, always someone to make you doubt. The devil will always try to come in and make you discouraged about the future. He will tell you there is no point. Luckily, Paul has a refusal to that. The second part of his verse is, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. <laughs> there is so much theology in this little bitty sentence, and I love it. So the first thing I have to point out is that Paul says we are created in Christ Jesus. This is important. Not only are we God's handiwork, but we are also modeled after the best of the best. Jesus himself, the guy we all look up to. Think about it. Recall his ancestry, in fact. Adam, to Abraham, to David, to Joseph, his father, and finally Christ himself. Jesus was in the work since the beginning, since creation, since Adam. If God was working on Jesus since then, think about how long he's been working on us. We have been in the works since creation, through our ancestors. Every person in your family line since then has had a purpose, even you. Each person is a cog in a machine. You guys remember the first Incredibles movie? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. There's that scene where Bob goes into his boss's office and he's getting chewed out for like actually doing his job. And his boss says, a company is like an enormous clock. And the clock only works if all the little cogs mesh together. It's kind of the same idea, but more moral this time. Each person has that purpose. They may be big or small, made of different materials, but the clock cannot work without each cog. You included. You are your own cog, and you have a purpose and machine. Unfortunately, I have a spoiler for you guys. Jesus isn't the end of the story. And he wasn't the end of the story. And it won't end with you either. If the story ended with Jesus, we wouldn't have Paul to write most of the text. If the story ended with Jesus, we wouldn't have the early church. If the story ended with Jesus, we wouldn't have people like Thomas Hubbard to die for him. If the story ended with Jesus, we wouldn't have hope for the future. The story did not end with Jesus, and it won't end with you. Don't let it end with you. Now, I'm not demanding you have kids. That is not what I'm saying. <laughs> there are other ways to carry on the kingdom of God without continuing the family lines. What I am saying is that we are created with a purpose. We have a reason to exist, and that means doing our part here in the now. And Paul says it right here. Look, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That is the crux of it, to do good works. That's our purpose. That's what we can do to advance the kingdom of God. Now, of course, these good works can vary from person to person and depending on their calling, but that's a sermon for another time. Mm -hmm. For now, what I'm saying is this. We're on a big God-fueled machine that isn't finished yet. He's still working on it. That plan is still in motion. You're a thread in an unfinished masterpiece that God is still weaving together. So we've discussed how each person is God's handiwork and how your ancestry has led down to where you are now and how all of us have been made in Christ's image as well. That is certainly all very well and good for the past and the present, but what about the future? How does it affect our future? I really am very glad you asked. Please keep these questions coming. <laughs> the answer lies in the final segment of that passage, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has systematically worked out every little detail into our future. This means so much for us. This means we have something to look forward to. God has plans. Again, you are in the works since creation, and it won't end with you. You have a future, and now you're here as Ozark Christian College students. Yay! <laughs> Learning about the Bible and all the different fancy terms for how to study it properly. That's just it, though. We're students. We're young adults slightly older teenagers who have no idea what we're doing. 
We have doubts in our minds and worries in our hearts. You've barely left the house, and now you have to find your own way, but God has it all planned out for you. You just need to keep going. You say to yourself, I can't do that. I can't do this. I'm this, I'm that, and that's okay, because those thises and thats are God's building blocks, and He's going to use them to further His machine, His plan. Some of you have already accomplished great things, Good! Keep it up! But for those of us who have nothing to show for ourselves, and in the words of the great Sherlock Holmes, the game is still young. We are still young, and there's still so much future left ahead of us for us to realize in God's plan. Do you guys know why I wrote this sermon? I didn't write it for a grade. I mean, I, okay, I wrote it for a grade. But even though I kind of wrote it wrong, I still wanted to say it because I have so many friends who are giving up. They're giving in to the doubt and they think they have no future. And I didn't want that anymore. I want you guys to realize that there is a future. God has it all planned out. You cannot let the past end with you. All of your ancestors, all of their progress, everything that they gave up cannot end with you. You have to keep going. You have to realize it. So please, go. Realize your future and do good works, no matter how much doubt gets thrown at you.